In this video, you're about to learn how we handle phishing emails. Now, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, phishing is so easy to avoid. Just don't click the obvious scam looking emails. Well, after working for a few months now, I've encountered close to every type of email you can imagine from scammers, and they're not always so obvious. About half of our alerts as the new analysts are phishing emails. So this is a large part of the role at the moment. Let's break down what type of phishing emails there are and how we investigate and prevent compromise. Let's begin with types of emails. You have the English is my second language emails, where it's pretty obvious by the grammar alone, something is off. These can be easily caught, but sometimes when someone is either really busy and skim an email, they don't notice the grammar and click that urgent document pending approval. Or since the company has employees literally across the entire globe, English could very well be their second language. So to the employee, that might not be a red flag and they're not going to notice that. Then you have the I caught you on the adult website and will leak info to everyone you know if you don't deposit to this Bitcoin address emails. These prey on someone's fear of losing their job and reputation. These are obvious phishing emails, but sometimes there's someone in the company who might think their recent web session was actually caught. <laughs> you know who you are. Seems like a fair deal to pay a small amount of Bitcoin to make it go away. Then you have the credential harvesting emails, which are the bulk of the true positive phishing emails we deal with. Either emails coming from random Gmail accounts, compromised business accounts, or the sending address is completely spoofed. And typically it's described as something they would need to view. So the subject line and the body of the email are gonna use business keywords, as well as a sense of urgency words like urgent, immediate, 24 hours, there's also their please click here to review your quarantined emails tactic, which is a common email someone would get. However, they might not notice that the sender is from a random address and not from their email provider's quarantine address like Microsoft.quarantine or something like that. Last and actually the least of the malicious emails we receive are very strange social engineering types of emails that either want to start a conversation with an internal employee to build trust and compromise their account or leak data further down the line of communication, or they're oddly placed secret messages in new account creation automated emails. We've been receiving a lot of various sites like TED Talk, where one of our internal users will receive a new account creation email with, with a long string of Chinese characters for their account name, which then appears in the automated email. So it would say something like, hello, insert your first name here when you create an account but in this case it was a long string of random text the message loosely translated to send money to this account which has got to be the worst method of soliciting money i've ever seen phishing emails unfortunately make up some scary statistics which may surprise you but does provide me some job security according to cybertalk.org 30 percent of phishing emails are opened 42% of workers self-reported taking a dangerous action which is defined as clicking an unknown link downloading a file, or exposing personal data online. Roughly 65% of cyber attackers have leveraged spear phishing as a primary attack factor. Now, spear phishing is just very targeted phishing, usually higher up executives or someone with access to certain useful data. 60% of security leaders stated their organizations lost data due to phishing. 52% have experienced credential compromise from phishing. 47% have contended with ransomware from phishing. So needless to say, we're still at war with phishing emails and educating everybody on proper prevention practices. Moving on to the important part, and this is probably why all of you are here. How do we deal with the various phishing emails? There's two main methods of prevention. There's user submitted phishing, which is when a person sees an email and they're like, this is strange. They can report it and then we investigate it. These are great for really well-crafted emails where our email filter can't pick it up but I'd say the true positive phishing emails that come in are usually less than 10% of what's reported. So a lot of our work in, in user submitted phishing is just telling them this is fine. The second method is our machine learning driven email filter. This will pick up most of the credential harvesting emails as the machine learning engine, if you wanna call it that, will look at the links in the email and determine if the site or sites it leads to have some type of login credential request uh, it also handles the removal of these emails in the environment. So if everything goes according to plan, a phishing email comes in, gets flagged as credential harvesting, the email is removed, the alert is closed. However, certain email accounts need further access that the filter can't reach. So for those, we do have to do a few extra steps, remove the email from the environment, and then we can close the alert. In either case, user submitted phishing or email filter, the process of investigation remains the same. 
I take a cursory glance at the sender, the email header, the reply to, and any other message header information that could be useful to indicate that the sender is or isn't spoofed. If the actual sender is some obscure address with like a .ru, then it gives me a sense of urgency. I check every link URL in the email using a sandbox. I will either use any run or URL scan. If I'm positive the link doesn't contain any actual business data, emphasis on the actual part because we definitely don't want business information leaked through our investigations, that's grounds to get canned. And I like my job. If I'm not sure if it contains business info, I'll run the URL in CrowdStrike Sandbox, which has been sufficient up till now to gauge what's inside of the URL or link. Some of you might be thinking, why would there be a link to sensitive business data? Wouldn't that just been attached in the first place? Well, OneDrive links are very much a thing, as well as other similar sites that offer document storage. And oftentimes in those cases, it's a lot harder to gauge whether or not that's malicious because you do have to in fact click the link, which is bad if you're not on the security team. So then it's us. Other factors I pay attention to is the history of communication from the sender. Does it make sense that this email is coming in right now? Was there a lapse in time between the last time they spoke and now? If there is a lapse in communication, that's usually an indication that the sender's address is compromised. Uh oh. I also check if the recipient, the person who got the email, is BCC'd. A common tactic is to BCC a large email list to prevent bounce back emails. So if, say you're sending a thousand emails out to a very outdated list, you won't get a few hundred undeliverable emails back if you BCC people instead of directly sending it to them. Once we've made a determination on whether the email is in fact malicious, we have to determine whether or not the person who received it clicked any links in the email. So we'll check network logs. Yes! If we can't determine with 100% certainty that they did not click the links, then we'll reset their password and notify their boss that they messed up. <laughs> no, we'll just let them know that the email is potentially compromised and we'll reset the password and here's the password. I'd say that we reset passwords about once or twice a week. Uh, not terrible considering the size of the company, but also most of the time it's just to be safe and not actually compromised accounts. It hasn't happened yet, but if someone were to open an attachment, or open a downloaded file from a link, we'd also have to re-image their computer just to be safe. My favorite thing to write in ticket notes is out of an abundance of caution. Now with the user submitted phishing, there's of course a lot of false positives. I'm constantly writing in my notes, not sure why this was reported, but I get it. You just wanna be safe and make sure something wasn't malicious. However, with the email filters, there's rarely any, thanks to our fine tuning. There have been some, and in those cases, we have to go and unquarantine the email, which just sends the email back to the user's inbox. And if the filter continues to block emails from the sender, then we have to go in and tune the filter with exceptions uh, to allow the traffic to go through. And oftentimes this includes contacting the email filter vendor so that they can put in some tweaks as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it for phishing email analysis as far as my day-to-day -day goes with them. I hope that was helpful insight for someone just starting out. It's definitely the easiest part of my job, but it eats up a good portion of it as well as I'm the new analyst on the team and haven't really been given the fun threat intel and tuning responsibilities just yet that the senior analysts have. Thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry I haven't been able to post any new videos these past few weeks. Um, I lost my father at the beginning of the month unexpectedly. Uh, then I got COVID and then I got another flu after that. Um, and some of you might notice my voice is a little bit off. It's just barely now coming back. But I'll try my best to release a little bit more consistently. But yeah, thank you again for watching. Rest in peace, Bob.